Uh, give everybody a warm welcome tonight. Uh, thanks for coming to the ministry meeting. And thanks for coming to listen to me speaking from the Bible again. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm well aware that we can be weary in sometimes. I hope it won't be that tonight. And hope that we hope we meet together. It will be a blessing to us. And at least produce some thought in our minds as to the Word of God. What I'm going to read tonight, brethren and sisters, is topical in a measure. In the last two or three weeks, there's hardly a person in this hall, you'll have at least handled a calendar for nearly every one of us who's given a calendar to people. Almost every woman here will have hung a, hung a calendar in the wall, and if you're anything like our house, there'll be loads of dates and loads of items written in those calendars. 99% of it, I wouldn't have a clue what it's all about or what dates have to be remembered or birthdays have to be remembered. But every woman here will know what it is to have a calendar full of dates and, and times and, and things she needs to remember and things the family needs to remember. I want to read tonight from Leviticus 23 and look at God's calendar. Look at God's calendar. and uh, It's called, you, you, the technical name for it is the Feast of the Lord or the Feast of Jehovah. And it's a very big subject, and whenever, whenever, uh, you know, basically speaking, when there's nobody wanting to take the meeting tonight, uh, we, we, had, we had someone almost conjoled into doing it, and he'll do it again for us, and we'd be glad to hear him, and he won't bore you, I know, as much as I will, and I mean that. But nevertheless, when I, when I looked at that subject again, I felt there's far too much here for the 40 odd minutes or so, so I'll just scuff it, cuff, cover it very briefly. And if you have any interest in it, take your slow way to Richards and buy a book on the Feast of Jehovah. John Stubbs writes a very good one. Uh, there's the old writers like A.J. Holiday and, and John Ritchie also do great works on it. And you'll be able to put bones or meat on the very fine skimming of bone. And you'll be able to understand that Tommy doesn't know his subject as well as he should do. Because I've, I've got to know that as well as I've read this subject again. About four or five years ago, coming out of the Breaking of Bread one morning... Uh, the brother who was taking the, the Bible class, he, he came down to me and he said, Tommy, I can't be here today and I haven't arranged anyone to take it. Could you take it? And I was a wee bit flabbergasted. I, I, I think, you, you'll understand, brother and sisters, I, I think a lot about my Bible, probably my biggest pastime. But just that day, he caught me off a wee bit and I didn't know what I was going to speak on. When I went home, this chapter just came into my mind. The new year had just started. So this is a, a spin-off from that. And I want to look at God's set feasts, God's calendar, and see how it affects us and what we can learn from it as we look at Israel's festive season confronted by God. Now, I won't read the chapter. I'll just nip into it. You can fill it out yourself. And as I say, uh, get yourself a book on it or sit down for it. And some, some of my brethren here have Schofield's Bible. I'm really sure the brother who was to speak here, who may have spoke here tonight, is the Schofield Bible. And Schofield's outline of this is very good. Very, very good. And I know I'm using the Newbury Bible tonight. I recommend what Schofield says totally. You can depend on it and apply it and apply his references. And you'll come out in a much more simple way of what I'm going to say tonight. But Leviticus 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, holy calling together. Even these are, this is lovely, brethren, even these are my feasts. These are my feasts. Brethren and sisters, God is sharing with us, sharing with his people, that which is precious to his own heart. This is what he's calling them together to share that. Now, there's seven feasts of Jehovah. We we'll start reading those seven feasts, as it were, uh, from verse 5. But I want you to notice verse 3. These are my feasts I've read. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. A holy calling together, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein, and as the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwellings. Now, that was one of the feasts, brethren and sisters. So some of our commentators tell us there's eight feasts. And I'm an eight feast man. I believe God is the God of the eight. He's always moving on to new ground. He's the God of the perfection and the seven things he deals with. But eight always takes us to a new beginning. And brethren and sisters, we start with the Sabbath. 
and the chapter will end with the Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, before I say anything else, the Sabbath feast was weekly. The rest of the feasts we'll read about are yearly or weekly. Lost for a week, that's what I mean. But brothers and sisters, God will remind his holy people, has called out people of Israel in a day past. Of the Sabbath. Of the wondrous creation he, out of his own hand and goodness and grace, brought into being in Genesis. And he has never changed his mind. God never changes his mind about things. His first thought, Harry Aaron said, said so blessedly, is his last thought. And what he begins with, he ends with. And whatever comes in between to destroy and to pollute and to ruin, <coughs> God will move to bring his plan, purpose to utter fruition in a very blessed way. I think he takes seven feasts to do it here. And as you look at them with me briefly tonight, you'll understand what God has done. The, the Sabbath takes us to God's original intention. These are earthly feasts. One of them will deal with the church in typical form. Israel would perhaps never have understood the feast of Pentecost. Two loaves baking with leaven. Leaven was so foreign to their worship. But you know, God was revealing in typical form something of a hidden mystery that he would only bring out whenever Paul would come. But we'll we deal with that when we get to it. But think of the Sabbath. Creation Sabbath. He brought them into the land, Canaan Sabbath. They never fully took Canaan. But brethren, there remaineth the Sabbath keeping for the people of God, and Christ is going to bring in a full and eternal salvation rest through his great salvation. And we, we look forward to that. That is why God begins with Sabbath and ends with Sabbath. Sin upset it. God has moved to bring his people back into it again. I hope that makes sense in some way. This, this is a dispensational chapter. Brethren who read their Bible closely will realise that the seven feasts of Jehovah in one way or another are dealt with in Numbers 28 and 29 and Deuteronomy 16. Your margin of your Bible will tell you that. The, the reasons for the differences are worth looking at, but we have no time to deal with that tonight. I just want to look at this. God's calendar, it's chronological. It starts at the beginning, moves its way through to the end, and it's just like, the, uh, if you don't mind me using the silly illustration, it's just like the calendar in the wall. We begin at the beginning and right through the year. And you could turn over, maybe your birthday is away in October or November, and you could look across and your wife will have written on your birthday or your children's birthdays or, or the day you go on holidays or the day you have to go to the doctors or whatever it is. I know, I know I'm lessening scripture speaking that way, but you know what I'm trying to say. God has given us here chronologically in this one chapter his dealings with mankind. And brethren and sisters, I, I love, John Stubbs puts this little on the words from someone else, he quotes from someone else, and he calls it the sacred calendar of the history of redemption. And that's what it is, the sacred calendar of the history of redemption. We can learn so much by looking at what God has brought his people into. Now again, this would take time. Leviticus take ages to do this. Leviticus brethren is divided into roughly four parts. Roughly. We've looked at the offerings before, the worship of God. And then we think of the cleansing as the washing of the people. And here brethren we have the ways and walks of God's people. What God is teaching his people to do in this book. We reach that. And brethren and sisters if we were to reach anything of divine purpose and understand anything of the divine ways, God has to get his portion. He really has. And I need to know cleanliness in my life. I need to be washed. Just like Daniel, when he was in the land of Babylon, before he ever got a prophecy, he refused the Babylonian meat. It wasn't for him. And then God was able to give him something of divine purpose. Now, that's very briefly on the surface. The first four, brethren, feasts that we read about here today, very, very broadly speak to us of the first coming of Christ. The first coming of of Christ. I read I start to read here and then you know, we we'll just pick up the thing. Verse four, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy callings together, holy convocations, 
which he shall proclaim in their appointed season. What numerous margin. And the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. That's one feast. And on the fifteenth day of the same month, the feast of unleavened bread. I love this, brethren. Unto the Lord. Unto the Lord. And then we have the details of that holy convocation for seven days. Verse 9, third, uh, the third feast. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come unto the land, that's important, which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then shall ye bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now we'll look at that in a moment or two. And then we draw our eye out of uh, feast four. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, that links with the last feast. From that day that ye brought the sheaf of the way of offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And we look at the details of that in a minute. You realize that 40 minutes isn't going to be... And I, I've been, I thought I'll be able to do this the way I've done it in the Bible class. Just mention it briefly. There's so much in it. I've enjoyed it so much in my own soul. We'll look at these first four feasts. The first four feasts. I want to call it rather the Feast of Passover, God's Plan for Salvation. These, these elaborated titles have come from different works. Some of them are my own. I want to boast a wee bit. Uh, but many of them are from other brethren who have written on them. God's plan for salvation, the feast of Passover. I want to think of the feast of unleavened bread, God's provision for sanctification. No leaven in all their dwellings. I want to thank brethren and sisters of the feast of first fruits, God's pledge of security. Brethren and sisters, there's a blessed man out of the tomb on the other side of death in the land across Jordan. His victory is secured and the victory is ours. And brethren, he is the pledge of a massive harvest of the redeemed forever who will share his resurrection life. Christ the first fruits, that, that rings a bell on all our souls. Afterwards, they that are Christ that is coming. I tell you, there's a blessed man who's crossed Jordan. What a wonderful work he has accomplished. And what a wonderful place he fills in the heart of God. I tell you what a day it was in Israel's history. When the priest, this is the first mention of the priest in this chapter. And brethren, that priest would take the way of sheaf. And he would wave it before Jehovah. God would bring them into a plenteous place. And the first one out of the tomb, brethren, Christ the first fruits. We have before God, I tell you, God was a God of rest and a God joyful and happy. There was a man on the other side of death. And I tell you, Satan's kingdom, that was finished. There's something on the other side of death. And if, and if Christ the first fruits, there's a mighty harvest to follow. Satan has failed. His kingdom lies in tatters and ruins. And you say, Tommy, you wouldn't think that. Well, then let us learn the principle of the feast, brethren. Because God's calendar, if you look down over your calendar, if you look at last year's calendar or last year's diary, all those dates will be the same for birthdays and weddings and whatever and whatever and whatever. And in them, there'll be sad days. Days when it didn't work. Days when you were heartbroken. We know the history of the world has been a dark history. But brethren, God is a calendar. And what he has prophesied and promised in this calendar will never fail. It will never, ever fail. We can take heart as God's people. The victory has been won. The victory is ours. For us. And might came forth the mighty one. He fought the fight for us. The triumph won. And Bonner could well say the victory is ours. I don't live in the good of that victory. Because I'm always worried about something or whatever. Or bird, but you wouldn't think that, but that's the way it is. But if I have faith to see it, God already has his calendar written. And brethren, it begins in redemption. And it ends with the people dwelling in their tabernacles and their booths. And I just I just run through these very briefly. 
The feast of Passover, God's plan for salvation. God's bringing them out. He's bringing them out. And he's doing it by the blood of the Lamb. We preached about that a couple of weeks ago at the harbour. And everybody that preaches the gospel thinks of the precious redeeming blood of Christ. And when you think of the, the Passover lamb, we're, they're, we're brought, bef- brought before us as we turn to Exodus 12 mm-hmm. as a lamb without blemish, a meal of the first year, all the glories of Christ, the wonderful perfections of the one who stepped up to deliver us out of Egypt, away from the wrath that was to come. Whenever the wrath was passing through the lamb, destroying the firstborn, these people were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Brother, every one of us in this hall tonight know that. Not just as a story from the Old Testament, but as a living reality in our hearts. There was a day, brother, when, typically speaking, we applied the blood. And we knew that God's word was true. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And brethren, the plague didn't come near us. Never well. Precious blood but richer blood, I'm going to quote Bonner again, but richer blood has flown from nobler veins. And brethren, in the power and good of Passover, we step out of Egypt, redeemed who we love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of God. That's where God's calendar starts. That's where the pathway and God's plan and provision for us starts. It starts by the blood of of Christ. Takes us back to salvation. Takes us back to a day whenever we escape the wrath of God because another had died for us. And you may say, Tommy, that's very gospel. You know, you're nothing a wee bit deeper than that. No, I haven't. I don't think to eternity we'll get anything deeper than that, brethren. That the blood of God's dear Son was shed for us at Calvary. He starts with the Passover. Every one of us needs a Passover to get out of Egypt. We can leave Egypt, brethren. We can leave Egypt behind us. But brethren, not be redeemed. These people knew the value of precious blood. For you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. I'm going to cut out a bit of that for both the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Immediately. So one day feast. This is only a one day feast. Passover, uh, the 14th day of the month at even. You know, everyone knows this. If you read the book of Exodus, God changed the calendar and all for Israel. This, shall, this month shall be the beginning of months. That was read a couple of weeks ago. As well. God just first, just God just put their past forever behind him. He says, we're making a fresh start now. This is going to be the first of the month, the 14th day of the month. God's salvation, bringing them out. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Read that there. On the 14th day of the month, verse 5, verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. God's provision for sanctification. If God's going to pay so much to bring a people out of Egypt, brethren, he wants to keep them out of Egypt. He wants to keep them out. God didn't save my soul to allow me to spend and waste my years in the world. He didn't do it. He didn't do that. That's not the way it works. When I was newly saved, I didn't know anything about these things. And when I look back on my early Christian life, brethren, I'm glad to have been preserved from anything deeply morally wrong in any way. But brothers and sisters, the principle of this didn't apply right away to my life. I was saved and knew I would never be in hell and fluttered about and wasted time doing nothing terribly wrong but doing nothing. Brothers and sisters, on God's calendar, on the 14th day of the month, the man's redeemed, or on the 15th day of the month, there's no interval. He purges out every ounce of leaven from his habitation. Everything that's unsuitable to the character and nature of God must go. And these people, brethren, are holy for God. The leaven is God. I'm still one of those who believe that leaven invariably, without question, speaks of evil in the Bible. It always does. There is not one pinhead of leaven in the meal offering. It wouldn't be suitable for the holy spotless Christ of God he couldn't have leaven anywhere near it 
we look at level later on and when we come to the feasts of uh, the feast of uh, uh, weeks but brothers and sisters how are we getting on seven days boy that's a terrible way to be without level how are we getting on brother on a practical way <coughs> any level in my life Brother, for me to read this makes me cringe. Makes me want to crawl into a hole and go away. Makes me ashamed to even try and help them in the assembly. And you say, Tommy, you must be doing something dreadfully wrong. No, no, there's nothing like that in my life, brethren. But I tell you, there's a wee bit of leaven here and there. Oh no, it's nothing deeply, deeply sinful or wretched around. No, no Christian brethren would touch anything deeply sinful or wretched. Surely we have thought of it. For brethren, there's a terrible lot of worldliness has come into my life. A terrible lot of other interests. A terrible lot of other things. We say, well, sure, sure they're legitimate. What was that, what was that legitimate about a piece of leaven? It only raises bread, you know. Brethren and sisters, we will never be anything for God while we tamper with level. I will never be the man that I should be and could be unless I utterly and totally, utterly and totally and completely rid leaven from my life. I, I, I'm, I'm making a statement here. And it's up to me to do it. These people had to do it. The day immediately after the redemption, leaven was gone. Say, Tommy, you guise up, you couldn't do that. Hey, about the sense we live in a world the TV's blaring and the computer's blaring and the radio's on. You, brethren and sisters, in a past generation, people who knew a lot less Greek than I do, and I don't know very much Greek, they put everything of leaven out of their house. They put everything that would defile them away from them. They kept at, an ar- at, a, at, a boat, at a boat pole's length everything that would destroy and defile their testimony because they appreciated the value of the blood on the door and if God demanded an unleavened life, that was what they were willing to do. It's up to me. I have no judgment to pass on you because there's just a big pile of flesh between you tonight, sadly. And, and when I say that, again, I ought. I, I wouldn't be here with an open Bible if I was doing anything that's dreadfully wrong. But brethren, there's little portions of leaven that are not suitable for the redeemed life. Oh, there is. Can God, will we have any power in how it's there? We won't have an ounce of power. Will the fruit in the gospel that we can see be as fruitful as it will? We, we, we will weaken, if you know what I mean. Our ability to see blessings while there's leaven in our homes. Now, I'm not talking about in our life, in any type of our life. If there's ten pounds going into my hip pocket that doesn't go through the books, brethren, it's leaven that's not suitable. I can do it any day of the week and nobody would ever know. Not suitable. Never mind the rot that I could see in a phone. Never mind the tittle tattle of gossip. It's all leaven. Hatred to you and hatred to him and hatred to somebody. It's all leaven that needs to be purged out. The feast of Jehovah, brethren, God says there won't be any time in between. You say, oh, that, that doesn't make, that does, that does, make, does make work realistically. Realistically, it hasn't worked with me. Sadly so. But this is what God says in his calendar he wants. A people redeemed. A people brought out. And a people, brethren, kept out with no thing of leaven about them. (coughs) Could this be applied to us? I'll not take time to read it. You know the verse as well as I do. (coughs) 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Christ our Passover. This is this here. Christ our Passover. A sacrifice for us. Let us keep the feast. Oh, that's the Lord's Supper. Does that's not the Lord's Supper, brethren? It involves the Lord's Supper. Let us keep 
I like the words in some translations, let us keep festivity. It's the feast of unleavened bread. Think of the rottenness and the wretchedness and the wickedness of Corinth. They had let leaven in, and the whole church was permeated by it. For a little leaven leaveneth the whole of that's what the New Testament that's how you can apply this to the New Testament. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Let us keep the feast, not with the unleavened bread of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread. Brethren, God would have us to be a holy people for him. We won't have any power until we have. You may say, Tommy, well, sure you have to be up there blethering at us. And, you know, <clears throat> brethren, let us all judge our souls. What we can cleanse and put out from our lives that is unsuitable. You think of a blessed man. I wonder what it was like for God. I often wonder what it was like for God. Morning my morning to waken as I learned. A soul and heart and holy manhood bowed to the will of his God. Without a trace of Adam's sin. Everything I do seems to be cursed by this fall and ruined by the wretched nature I have. Everything misjudged and misapplied. Brother and God would have us to be a holy people. Let us keep the feast. Seven days. Complete circle of time. Seven speaks of completeness in the Bible. You all know that. And brother and these people that were redeemed. It wasn't being holy on a Sunday. It wasn't being holy before the Bible reading. Or holy before you take a ministry meeting. Seven full days. A complete circle. For God's glory. I tell you brethren. I say it for myself, so I'm not getting at anyone. God has weakened our testimony. Satan has weakened our testimony by putting leaven into our hands. And we have brought it in. I, I, I'm not, by the way, I'm not talking about the old ministry of TVs and all that. That's all I'm getting. Whatever it may be, whatever it may be, if I don't live a holy life, I will never be in the good of redemption the way I should be. I won't be. I can't be. Sin ruins fellowship with God. And Levin speaks of sin. God says, for seven days, you'll purge the whole lot out. And you'll live for me. Now, the next uh, um, feast, feast of first fruits. And the Lord speaks on the Moses saying, this is uh, uh, feast three. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest thereof, and you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits. Now, brethren, I've already said to be enough on that just at the minute. But, brethren, brethren, this is God's pleasure of security. A blessed man has come out. He has come out of death. He has come out of the place of ruin. He has, he has come out of the place where he carried his people's sins to, as it were. And he has become the mighty victor of it all. This is Christ in resurrection. So we have Passover, our salvation. We have the feast of unleavened bread, our sanctification. We have the feast of first fruits. That blessed man in resurrection, our glorious Saviour. And he's to be waved before the Lord. I, I, I love some of the notes, brother, and I've got them from so many people. Christ the first fruits, that speaks of his preeminence, doesn't it? Christ the first fruits, he's the pledge of our resurrection. Wonderful. Brethren and sisters, it's the first mention of priesthood, as I've said. Brethren, because Christ would not have been a priest on earth. I know that he functioned in priestly ways. But brethren, he took priesthood and resurrection. <coughs> Wonderful. This is the resurrection portion of the feasts. Brother of the purity of Christ and I want to read this. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. I love that, brother. Not, not for our forgiveness, for our acceptance. My acceptance and my justification is in a risen Christ. There is a man outside of death, beyond the pale of judgment altogether. In resurrection we render a new realm altogether, where sin and death can never touch again. It's called justification in Romans. That's why Romans is the apostle of Christ's resurrection. And brethren, we stand accepted in him. 
And on the morning after the Sabbath, the priests shall wave it. Lovely. The morning after the Sabbath. That would take you to the end of the Gospels, wasn't it? As the Sabbath ended and it dawned towards the first day of the week. This is the first mention, you know, of the first day of the week. The day after the Sabbath. It's not specifically called the first day of the week. But it's the first time in your Bible. It's mentioned the day after the Sabbath. What a day it was. Christ was risen. He had left all that behind. A new life had been given to his people. And he shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf. <coughs> and he lamb without blemish of the first year. How long have we been at Somebody says, we read some of that earlier. No one in the chapter you. But it's just nearly the same as Exodus 12. Isn't it? A lamb, a he lamb, without blemish. A meal of the first year without blemish. For a burnt offering. Brethren, we're on the other side of death, on the other side of judgment. Everything is according to the heart of God and for the mind and soul of God. And now let's bless man or he, he is all that he was at Passover. He's all of that. The Lamb without blemish of the first year. A burnt offering now. A burnt offering for his blood to be applied. Not so much that now, brethren. To be offered as a burnt offering. An ascending offering unto the Lord. Resurrection's a wonderful thing, brother. And God is the God of resurrection. That's where God works with his people in the grounds of resurrection. That's where our blessings are held in the risen man. I love what else it goes on to say. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. And an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a, a savour of rest. Brethren, God has found rest in that blessed man. A savour of rest. And here's the first mention of a drink offering. You drink, you know yourself, wine is for the heart of God and for joy. Brethren, and the Lord Jesus Christ risen from the dead. There is a, a note of joy and gladness. It's almost, it's almost like the high priest's garments, if you don't mind me saying it, with the bells around the bottom of them. There's a joyful noise within the sanctuary. And there's a drink offering of holy joy poured out before God on this day whenever the feast of first fruits was offered. Take heart, brethren and sisters, there's a man in the glory, a man risen from the dead, a man who has perfectly met the heart of God in every way, and risen from the dead. There's a new order of man before God. He's just the same as he was at Calvary. Oh, the fullness of Christ's work. I, I love that. I just, I, I only really noticed that the other day. A lamb, a he lamb without blemish. Well, that's just the same as Exodus 12. And in all the fullness of what he was before he went to the cross. He rose from the tomb, adding to his glory the power of an everlasting life and an endless life. And brethren, he has carried fragrance unto the heart of God for us, his people. I'm enjoying the things in God's calendar. When I turn up our calendar at home and I see dentists and doctors, that would put you off and bother. But here, brethren, here, brethren, God is introducing us to some of the things that are, that are full of holy joy for us. Now, I better hurry up. The fifth offering, the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Pentecost, verse 15 to 22. And brethren, if we have God's plan of salvation, God's provision for sanctification, God's pledge of security, we have here God's promise of the Spirit. If I was to read all the verses like to these in the New Testament, we'd be here all night, but you do that. If you want to, I'm sure I haven't whetted anyone's appetite. I'm sorry about that. But if, you, if I have, if you want to, go home and look at the references. The promise of the Spirit. Your mind will immediately go. Will immediately go. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. When it had reached its fulfillment. That's what it means. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Acts chapter 2. What this type envisaged. What this type typified. Had met its conclusion. Had met its end result. 
when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Fifty days after the way of sheep was weaved. Fifty days after the Lord rose triumphant from the dead. The Holy Spirit came. Brother, what a word was his. He was the fulfillment of a promise. The Lord Jesus said, I send you the comforter. It was the coming of the divine person. For brother, the Holy Spirit is one of the Godhead. And there is a divine person on earth presently. And dwelling every one of us here. And that blessed person, not only is the fulfillment of promise. And the coming of the divine person. He's the giver of divine power. If I was doing the book of Acts, brethren, it's wonderful to see what a risen man and descended spirit can bring to the early church with all the opposition. There was just thousands saved and added, and, and added to that church in those early days. He's the binder together, brethren, of two divided entities. For Jew and Gentile so separated by the law and by God's ways in the past are now going to be presented to God as a new meal offering. This, this is what we've read here. You see, Tommy, you're not explaining all this. I wouldn't have time to explain it. I hope, I hope you'll take my word for it. And hope you'll go and get one of those books and enjoy it the way I have. And you shall count off to the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the way of offering. Seventh Sabbath shall be complete. Uh, verse 15, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Just there's something else I should say. This chapter is peppered with references to seven. God's calendar is complete, you know, brethren. There's no wee areas on it that you wonder everything's complete. Whenever he begins <laughs> something, he ends it. Whenever he gives us information about it, there's one wee bit here I just have to finish on it today. It doesn't give us very much information on it. But you know, we brethren will be able to put a wee bit, a, a picture on it and use it to God's glory. Seven Sabbaths, the descent of the Spirit, a new meal offering, a new meal offering unto the Lord, and ye shall bring out of your habitations two wee of loaves of two dense fields. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. Brethren and sisters, on the day of Pentecost, the church of God was born. It had never existed before that. It is never in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were not in the church. Moses was not in the church. Daniel was not in the church. All we who are dispensationalists know that. We understand that. We divide scripture scripturally. The church was born in Pentecost. The two we have loaves. We say, Tommy, you've got all this out of a book. I've got to write you better out of a book, brethren, but I agree with what I read. And as a young fellow, when I was hardly 20 years old and I first heard this minister on, it made so much sense to me that I went home rejoicing in it. Brethren, in the day of the descent of the Spirit, Jew and Gentile, were brought together as one offering unto the Lord, the church of God. Beat him with leaven. You say, Tommy, God would never make anything with leaven on it. Hey, about a sin. I tell you, you're only in chapter 5 in the book of Acts. Whenever you see a wee bit of leaven showing its face. <coughs> and brethren and sisters, as we move through it, you know, it's going to be only 30 years after Pentecost here at the church at Corinth, and there's a while there's a leaven on it. And on it goes. But brethren and sisters, those 50 days, the two way of loaves, the descent of the Spirit, they are the first fruits unto the Lord. It's not blessed, they are the first fruits. You say, Tommy, what does that mean? The work of Calvary, brethren, and you know this, will go beyond the present age. And if the casting away of the nation of Israel has brought life to the Gentiles, Romans chapter 11, 10 and 11. Read it yourself. What shall their bringing in be, brethren, but life from among the dead? You know, we are only seeing, we're glad to see everyone who comes to our meetings. Glad to see them. We're so glad to see a handful of people coming to hear the gospel. It does our souls good. But brethren, God is a mighty harvest coming. And the church... 
first fruits unto the Lord. The remnant of Israel, the rem, there's a remnant of Israel according to Romans chapter 11. I think I've got that right. Saved according in this day, added to the church, just a small remnant. But brethren, they are a testimony to a future day when the nation again will be born. And God will have fruit, a massive harvest, and millennial blessedness forever. So we have to leave that. And you shall offer with the, the, the bread seven lambs without blemish, one young bull, and so on. And I notice there's a sin offering here. You notice that. We're out of time, and that's what I meant to say. And the priest shall wave them with the bread for the Lord, and shall proclaim himself, saying, Day, so, you know, no survey work on their own, we stop you forever, even in your dwellings, through your generations. Uh, I must have verse here. Uh, there's a sin offering here. Where's it all? Uh, the offering, right? Offering, and you shall sacrifice one kind of the goats for a sin offering. Brethren and sisters, the failure in the church, God knows of it. But brethren, in these offerings, He has made that which allows us to stand before Him and all the acceptability of Christ. There may be failure in the church, the church which is his body. There may even be failure in our local assemblies. But brethren, as this two waves are waved before the Lord, this new meal offering, Ephesians chapter 3 and typical form if you want. Brethren and sisters, we thank God for our standing in Christ. We have a sin offering here. We have two, seven lambs, think of the perfection, without blemish of the first year, and a young bullock and two lambs for a burnt offering. There's much more in Christ, brethren, than the failure that we present as a church, which is his body, and even as local companies. I finished uh, briefly with this. Verse 22. And ye shall reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make the clean reddens of the corners of the field. Now, these first four uh, of feast feasts, they come very close together in springtime. Just a week between some of them, very, very closely. And then you have an undefined period, an undefined period. Notice that. It doesn't say from this month to that month or that date. It says, when ye shall reap the harvest of your land, ye shall not make the clean reddens. And I'm rushing through it here. Uh, Neither shall they gather any gleaning of the harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. The church has been born in Pentecost. Two millennium have come and gone. It's <coughs> happening. <coughs> Brethren, in those years, we are reaping the harvest of Calvary. I, 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 Running over this, we're reaping the harvest of Calvary, brethren. For two millennium, the fruit of Christ's work and the glory of what he has accomplished has been the harvest of the church. People being brought in, people being in an undefined time. Since the Lord has went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit has come. And in this we undefined time, we offer to the world during this time of harvest gleaning, as much as they want. We have a Christ and a gospel to preach without reservation, without hindrance, without stamp, without lament. <coughs> what Christ accomplished, brethren, wouldn't allow us to niggardly leave anything for anyone. Thou shalt neither, what does it say here? They shall not make a clean reddance of the corners of the field. There will be plenty for the gatherer there that thou reapest. Thou shalt neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. There's going to be harvest. There's going to be gleanings and, and loads lying everywhere. And you can think of the book of Ruth and so on. But brethren and sisters, in this undefined period, we have gospel's message for everyone. We have salvation to preach to every soul. We don't know how long it will be. Now, God's going to start up his, his place with Israel again. But we don't really know how long this period will be. 
And we are just of a little picture of harvest reaping. And leaving plenty of that harvest for anyone to come and last. You know, the commentators will tell us the poor refer to the nation of Israel. And maybe they do. That's a nice little application. And the stranger, the Gentile nations, harmfuls in purpose for all. We preach in the gospel of salvation for everyone. And I'm happy with that application. That, does this, that fits the bell very well. That's our present <coughs> position, brethren. A Lord on high. The Holy Spirit come, the church of God born, gleaning and the harvest fails. There's three other uh, feasts. And I'm going to call them the second or final coming of Christ. If the first thing will be the first coming of Christ, you the second or final coming. We have the feast of trumpets. Think of Numbers 10. Look up yourself. Those trumpets were formed out of silver. They were blown to call the congregation of Israel together. There, there's half a dozen things that were to be blue for. But one of them was to call them to the door of the tabernacle or the sanctuary. There's a day coming, brethren, when God will regather his people. Metaphorically, picture form, he gathered them to the door of the tabernacle. And that will take us, brethren, to the day of atonement. The feast of atonement. Verse 26 to 32. These, these all happen, brethren and sisters, within just a week or so. The seventh month, the blowing of the trumpets, his personal appearing. There's many trumpets in the Bible. But it's not the time, brethren, for dividing them or whatever, but this isn't the same as 1 Thessalonians 4. It's not the same as Matthew 24. This is the trumpet of Israel's regathering. Trumpet blown by a priestly man. Israel will be regathered. I'm speaking picture, pictorially. Gathered to the door of the tabernacle. What's going to happen there? The priest is going to end up <coughs> the feast of the day of atonement. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying also, on the tenth day, notice the tenth day, tenths the number of responsibility of this, of this seventh month. Whenever God starts moving with his earthly people again, when the clock of prophecy begins to tick, it will move very quickly. There shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. I would love to have read the related verses, but I, I won't do it, brethren. See the nation that rejected the Lord Jesus and gave him a cross. That nation will be born in a day. They look at him whom they pierced and they mourn for him as one mourneth for an only son. The day of atonement, a day of repentance and a day of remission. Israel's going to enter into the good of it. We believe, brethren, a future for the nation of Israel. This chapter and God's calendar tells us about it. After our day is done, which is only typically, faintly typified here, They'll be gathered again. I know they were gathered in 1947 to their land. I don't know where that's this or not, brethren. But there's a day coming whenever the trumpet will be blown and the faithful of Israel will return. And brethren, the day of atonement will be enacted. And all the fullness of Christ's complete and full atonement. Once in the end of the age he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And on the day which looked for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And that high priest who went in and effected a full atonement in all its greatness and glory will come out and pronounce blessing over his people. Israel will be saved. They will come into the good of it. Passover, brethren, takes us out of Egypt and saves us from wrath. The day of atonement, brethren, allows God to dwell with us for everlasting years. That's what the two sides of Christ's word not do. And then finally, we have the final feast of the seven. And the Lord speak unto Moses, verse 32, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This fifteenth day of this seventh month, now you're still in the seventh month, shall be the feast of tabernacles, or the feast of booths. For seven days. Brethren, the millennial reign of Christ lies ahead of us. 
the time of perfection on earth. Seven days, the only chamber to eternity. The only chamber, brethren, you have to read the chapter and go through it, to the two Sabbaths at the end of it. Brethren, God is going to bring in a Sabbath that will never end. It begins, brethren, with Israel, every man dwelling under his vine, every man resting in peace, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Dwellings. And brethren, in these very chapters, we have thought, which brings before us God's prophetic calendar, his personal appearing, his perfect atonement, his preeminent authority forever. God's calendar hangs before us. We are part of it, brethren. Thank God for redemption. Thank God for the church of God and for dispensational understanding of the ways of God. And we look forward, brethren, because if God has not been faithful to Israel, he, will, he has no reason to be faithful to us. But there's a day coming that the nation that rejected and crucified their very Messiah and all his perfection, God in his grace will blow the trumpet of free gathering again. And they will come into the good of the day of atonement again. And brethren, their sins will be put away forever. And they will dwell forever in peace before God. And even at that, uh, I hope we all have a good year with God's blessing. But God has given us a very spiritual year to dwell on. And Leviticus 23, and I hope God will bless us as we think of these things.